Uh, so I'm David Jones Shilardi. Uh, and as Peter mentioned, I'm a developer advocate uh, here at Datastax. So uh, just a little bit about the role and then a little bit about me. Um, so as advocates, we're all coders, we're operators, we're DBAs, things like that. Um, folks who have been doing this stuff for a while. And, you know, our whole goal in life, and at least especially at Datastax, uh, you know, we're so, you know, we're very Cassandra focused and everything is, is to bring Cassandra to, to everybody, right? And to help people learn um, and, you know, become aware of what Cassandra is, what you can do with it and, you know, and, and things outside of that as well, not just only Cassandra. Um, you know, so we're, we're developers talking to developers. That's kind of the idea. Um, so we kind of act as the zeroth user. Uh, usually we're getting stuff before it gets baked outside um, and we're kind of banging on it well outside the engineering and QA groups and stuff. We're kind of like a chaos monkey, if you will. But then we're also the conduit for developers like yourselves, um, who hopefully speak the same language, right? Uh, since we've been doing this kind of work, uh, and uh, and we bring that back to our teams to try to make the experience that much better. Um, as far as is as, as it comes to me, uh, I've been in this business. Uh, some of you, I think, will probably relate. Uh, I think I started my first coding exercise. I put that in quotes for a reason. Uh, on a Commodore 64, I was about eight. It's my, the, the joke I like to make, it was the first stack overflow if anyone ever copied code from one of those QBasic books where you're literally copying like the code line for line and just pasting it. And as long as you get them all right, you made a game, right? So uh, so I've been I've been doing this stuff um, for, for quite a while, uh, you know, God, God, going on 30 years maybe almost, right? Um, I actually had an interesting, interesting introduction uh, by one of the people who built Unix System 5 uh, back where I lived. He just happened to be donating computers to our school. I saw him donating these computers. The next thing you know, I was working on his 18T 7300s and learning how Ooh. to uh, do things at the shell. Yeah, it's fun stuff. Wow. So anyway, stuff I got hooked young. Commodore 64, maybe. Nice. Right? Anyway. Right. Well, actually, no, I went from having color to a green screen. I don't know. That was... Ooh, that, that, I have two... I have... I have a ton of stories there that I'm, I'm not going to take the whole hour to just go on about that. Um, but yeah, so I got, I got hooked back then. Uh, you know, I've worked in defense. Um, I've been in management. I've come away from that. I've, you know, spent a lot of time, most of my coding time in Java, but I've coded in plenty of other languages, you know, lots of JavaScript, C++, Perl, uh, shell scripting, um, Python, you know, whatever, uh, you know, whatever, whatever is needed, honestly. Objective-C, that was actually fun. Um, uh, so, so anyway, so that's, I, I think that's enough about me. Why don't we get into the content? Uh, as Peter said, ask before, your questions. Before we do that, David, oh, yeah, I let's see it. All, before we do I that, David, we all great. need to stop and admire Jason Erickson's background because that is legit. He's showing you how it's done. Is that's real. Is that real? No, it's no, is that, no, is that a, <laughs> is that a real screenshot of like your place? Okay. I'm I'm really sad now because I thought we were all gonna go there to have drinks because that looks yeah, pretty stacked right there. Yeah. All right. Okay. Oh, David, by the way, Robert C and, and Jason. Power. Yes, compute. What a great magazine for the Commodore 64. That's awesome. All right. So with that, yes, like I said, don't be shy. Definitely ask your questions. Things aren't clear. Let us know. Um, and Peter will do his best to uh, to let me know, and I'll try to keep an eye on things over there as well. Um, so you know, the, the whole topic here, intro to Cassandra for Java developers, it does seem like a couple of you um, have some familiarity with Cassandra, um, you know, and for those of you who don't, that's fine. As Peter said, this will be a gentle introduction to what Cassandra is about, you know, why you might care about it and, and such, and then where you can go with it um, and, and the tools and resources you have as Java developers. Um, so general kind of agenda, we'll start off with what the hell is Cassandra, right? Um, get into that. then. The next two sections are really going to look at, um, you know, what are the the basic, you know, kind of, you know, tools, uh, uh, you know, the tables, key spaces. What are the what's the terminology like? How do you do things in Cassandra? And for those of you who have come from a relational, uh, you know, background, most of us have if you've been around uh, for a time before NoSQL databases and such, then you're familiar with how to do things the relational way. But Cassandra is not a relational database. It's a little bit different. Um, so there is a different way to data model. It's not that big of a paradigm shift, but it is a shift. It is a difference. But once you get used to the pattern, it's it's really not so scary. Um, then I want to bring you a little bit into the drivers, uh, the drivers that are there, and something called Stargate. Uh, and I'll talk more about that when we get to it. Finally, we'll cap off with a Java SDK that you can use for and with Apache Cassandra. Uh, it is really cool because it will 
um, give you a lot of the capabilities right out of the box that you don't have to then go figure out yourself. And then I'm going to set you off with a bunch of resources. Um, we regularly do workshops where we're bringing, you know, and all of our stuff is free, by the way, everything I'm going to talk about today is completely free. Um, and for the resources, these are workshops, these are self service that you can go off do on your own, get some practice with the SDK if you want with with Cassandra and all of that. Um, so I'll talk about there at the end. Um, oh, <laughs> sorry, Peter, I'm just I looked at the chat and I just saw what you said. That was funny. That was, that was good. All right. So first thing, what is Cassandra, right? Um, Cassandra is a NoSQL and not only SQL distributed database, right? I said it wasn't relational. This is what I'm talking about. But the key thing is that distributed database. So Cassandra itself is comprised of individually an individual instance of Cassandra is called a node, right? And any given node will have about two to four terabytes of capacity and can handle many thousands of operations a second per core. Right now, the reason why it just says lots of transactions a second per core here is because it really depends on how that individual node is scaled, right? How that is vertically scaled, uh, disk, all sorts of things are going to determine how many that that is. Generally, though, for any given Cassandra instance, you're talking thousands of trans transactions a second per core. But I mentioned it's distributed, right? So it's not just a single instance. Even though you could run Cassandra on a single instance, if you did, it would kind of defeat the purpose of what the database is about, right? So it is a peer-to-peer -peer leaderless system. And the nodes, when you have all of these nodes in your ring here, um, they'll communicate over a protocol called gossip. Now, what they're communicating are things like token ranges, and I'll explain that in a moment, their status, all sorts of things. But the key thing I want you to take away here is that it is a completely leaderless system. There's no master slave or anything like that. Uh, and you can add nodes or remove nodes dynamically and such. Now, notice the ring. So in Cassandra, there's a concept called a data center. Um, so a set of nodes will then be connected in a, in a single data center. And Cassandra can have n number of data centers, right? And I'm going to show you some applications for that a little bit later, where you can have multiple data centers and how that comes into play. Now, Cassandra is a petabyte level database. I mean, this is a database that can handle a significant, significant amount of data. Now, it, and I'm not just talking about like throwing data in there and being able to store it. David. David, yes. I just want to make sure you realize that your screen might not be sharing. I don't know if I'm the only one that oh. is. Oh, oh, really? Yeah. Oh, well, that helps if I share my screen. How about that? Let yeah. me go back. So let me do this. Thank you for pointing that out. Here, this is what I just said. No problem. No problem. I'm just, gonna go like yeah. that. Here we go. Here we go. Node. We're gonna go Mulligan. right back through. I'm just gonna do this to the Mulligan. fast version, right? Can you see it, by the way? Yes. <laughs> okay. Good. Let me. By the way, let me. <laughs> yeah. Let me let me turn on. Let me see the chat. Give me a second. There we go. All right, good. Thanks yeah, for no, pointing that out. Yeah. That was like a total newbie move. Wow, I just totally knew newbie. All again. All right, so I was never here. This never happened. Yep. Right. Right. Yeah. Game on. All right. So as I was just talking about, single node. You know, it's comprised of multiple nodes. Uh, you have this concept of a data center. There we go. All right. Now you should see what I was talking to. Um, so, like I was saying, with the petabyte piece, right? It's one thing to be able to store that amount of data. It's another thing to be able to access that data at all TP speeds, right? Cassandra is built to perform and maintain its performance, whether you're talking a handful of nodes or thousands of nodes. And when I say performance, I'm talking like tight SLAs, writes in usually in the order of microseconds to very, very tight millis, and reads usually into the very tight milliseconds, right? And this is at any scale. So it's a kind of a key tenant of what makes Cassandra. Uh, from an availability Sandra standpoint, avail Cassandra was built to be very resilient and robust. You can lose a, a significant percentage of your nodes and still have an available database and still be able to get out consistent data, right? Um, from the geographical distribution standpoint, this is kind of what I was talking about with data centers. Uh, that's one aspect of it where you can actually have data centers, say, spread across the globe and use Cassandra's inherent replication that will automatically replicate data to those nodes and data centers for you at the speed of wire. Um, so there's all of this stuff was actually baked into why Cassandra was built in the first place. Uh, and if you want a little history, it actually came from Facebook originally, right? Um, it was actually, um, it was it was based off of uh, Bigtable and uh, the Dynamo paper, paper and stuff like that. Like, it, not, not AWS 11, Dynamo. No, right. not that Dynamo. Yeah, the Dynamo paper. Look up the Dynamo paper, right? But that'll give you kind of like where it came from. But it was Facebook at first 
that came up with Cassandra, because if you think about it at the time, you know, they were the only company in the world that was dealing with billions of users that were spread all around the globe. And they were running into scalability issues with their relational databases. And they needed to come up with something different. And that's where Cassandra was born out of. It has evolved greatly since then, but it's core tenets of what it was meant to be. It needs to be able to scale horizontally, right? On lower commodity hardware, be able to scale essentially indefinitely, be able to maintain its performance and also be able to be very resilient. So these things are baked into the core of what Cassandra is. The and last thing there is that vendor independent piece. You can install it anywhere, right? There's no lock-in. It's an open source project. You can put it on any cloud provider on-prem or whatever. Um, so yeah, you, you have control. And David, when David says <laughs> uh, high availability, um, I was actually, I have to admit, I was uh, pretty impressed by this. Home Depot is one of our customers. And oh, yeah. uh, David, please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I'm pretty sure we were told that they haven't had an outage in nine years. Yeah, they have one of their one of their clusters that's actually been around for quite some time. Um, that yes, they have had that thing running un, uninterrupted for for nine years. Sean Hannity, or uh, I almost the, said Sean the Hannity. only thing that I know that, that like goes that long unchanged or, or like is Linux systems, Twinkies, and cockroaches. Like that's about yeah. it. Yeah, and that's actually, I believe that's one of the inventory management systems. So it's it's pretty important, right? Um, and that's something that Cassandra is actually quite well known for, for those who are familiar with it. Now, I mentioned before that data is distributed in Cassandra, right? So if you take a look at the example here on the right, you're going to see I have this very simple table, and I have country, city, and population. And notice we've labeled country as a partition key. I'm going to talk more about the partition key coming up. Just know that in Cassandra, when you create a table, you're going to designate at least one column as a partition a partition key. So in this case, we're saying country is what we're going to partition our data by. Now, when I do that and I start inserting data, I mutate data in the database, Cassandra is going to handle automatically distributing that data around my nodes. So what I want you to notice is notice that I have some groups of rows here. I have things like USA, France, you know, um, uh, Germany that have been, those rows are grouped together. And something I'm going to talk about more in the data modeling section is things that, you know, any rows that share a partition key are actually going to be physically stored together. Now, the thing is, you don't need to worry about that underlying management. Cassandra does that for you. What I want you to understand here is that as you're mutating data, that that data is being distributed around your cluster. And this starts to kind of get into some of the benefits you're going to get with Cassandra. So let's talk about replication factor for a moment. So in Cassandra, you have this concept called replication factor. It is simply the number of replicas or the number of nodes a particular partition is going to go to. So let's start with one. If I have a replication factor of one, that just means that for any piece of data that comes in, any partition, that's just going to be replicated to one node. So you see here from our example earlier, OK, you know, I've got some data in the USA partition. I just have it on one node. Now, from an availability resiliency standpoint, this isn't that great, because what happens if I lost that one node? I just lost that data, at least for a time, right? Um, so now think replication factor two. What's this mean? I'm going to replicate the two nodes. So now if I have that same exact data, now I'm going to automatically replicate that to two nodes. Um, you can also imagine what might happen at replication factor three. Now, by the way, a replication factor of three is pretty much the standard, right? That is the standard. Even in a 1,000 node cluster, a replication factor of three is totally fine. Um, and what this, as you can probably think, uh, you know, what this means is now I'm going to have that same data replicated to three nodes. So I get some, start to get some benefits here, right? Um, think from a load balancing standpoint, as I have operations or requests that are coming in for a particular set of data, now I have three different nodes that could serve that data up. What happens if I lost a node or lost some data, you know, lost some nodes or something? I have multiple nodes that can facilitate that request. Um, and this is where Cassandra really starts to kind of come into its own. So I would say that if you're running Cassandra, yeah, if you're on like a test node and you're just experimenting or something, a replication factor is one. But the moment you start getting into any kind of real usage uh, or something, you should be in an R of a three right off the bat uh, to ensure you get this kind of nice balance. My mouse keeps coming out of uh, focus for some reason. OK, so how does data then get distributed to the individual nodes? So let's say I have some data coming in. Now, one thing that happens under the hood, as you are writing data into Cassandra, again, using our example of this partition USA that I have, that there's a, there's a partition um, 
there's an hashing algorithm in the partitioner. And as that partition key comes in, in this case, it's USA, it'll automatically get hashed out to a partition token. In this case, 59. By the way, these numbers, totally arbitrary. I'm using a, a scale from 0 to 100. The real token ranges are extremely large. It would be absurd to try to put them all on the page. That's why we just make it easy. So it's just here for illustration purposes. Um, so that 59 is just the hash value of USA. So what happens is, is when, when that data comes in, whatever node gets it, and again, Cassandra is totally leaderless. Any one of these nodes could handle the request. So when the data comes in, the node that handles the request is now what we call the coordinator. It's going to coordinate where that data goes, right? Um, so it's going to say, OK, well, what nodes own my partition token 59? Well, if you notice, all of the nodes here have a number on them, right? So I'm just saying that they each own a range of partition tokens. Again, this is something that Cassandra itself is doing. So when I have some data come in for a particular partition token, in this case, 59, the coordinator is going to go, OK, who owns that data? And it's these three nodes, right? So the nodes labeled 67, 83, and 0. Um, they all own the range here. And so when the coordinator gets that, it's going to forward that data onto those three nodes, right? So that's, that's happening for you automatically under the hood. Now, I mentioned earlier what happens if a node goes down or something like that. This is where part, uh, Cassandra comes in, and it starts some of its robustness features come into play. Um, so what will happen is if the coordinator detects that a node is down, it'll automatically store something called a hint, right? It'll store it there on the coordinator. Then when that node comes back up, it'll automatically replay the hint on that node. So this is one of the ways that Cassandra self-heals, right? It's going to heal on its own. There are actually tons of other mechanisms that do that. I'm just giving you the very high level version. Um, but really, I just want you to understand that Cassandra is, you know, it's going to repair itself if it needs to automatically. And that's part of its robustness. All right. OK, so how are we doing on questions, by the way, before I move on here, Peter? It, it looks OK. I, OK, I just cool. put some heckling comments in there. We're, we're all good. Oh, were you heckling yeah. me? And I didn't even see it? Oh, that's too bad. No, it's, all, it's fine. All right. All right, so I mentioned before that Cassandra has this concept of data centers, right? You can have n number of data centers. If you take a look at the left, you'll see that we have the globe, you know, map of the globe, right? Um, so in this in this case, we have three data centers that are spread around the globe. Now, why might I want to do this? Well, if you think about it, if I have users or if I have my database is only in the US and I have a bunch of users that are in Australia, just the latency over the speed of wire, right, is by today's standards, is going to be way too slow. Um, that is going to cause users who are further away from the data center more and more latency than it would for those that are close to it. So we want to spread that data out. We want to, we want to have different data systems. We want to put the data as close to them as possible. So that's what we're doing here. So I have a data center over in the US, one in EMEA, and one in APAC. Now, what's cool with replication that we were just talking about is if I write data to say one of the nodes that's over there in you know, the, the US data center, that will automatically get replicated to the other data centers at the speed of wire, right? And again, Cassandra's write speed is so you know within microseconds usually that it, it is practically speed of wire. That's why we say it that way. Um, so what that means is if I write data somewhere in that US data center, somebody in China could read that data from their data center right away, right? Um, so that is what we're talking about by using data centers for geographic distribution. There's also another play here. Um, you know, if you think about it, EMEA GDPR with security, that's totally a thing. Um, you might need to have different security parameters in different data centers, and you can totally do that with Cassandra as well. Now, on the right-hand side, you see where we start to talk about the hybrid cloud and multi-cloud. Um, so what that really is is, you know, it, let's say you have your on-premise installation, and that's all you have. But then you are a retail operation, Black Friday is going to happen, and you need to burst up. But you don't want to procure all that hardware and pay all that money just for it to sit there most of the year. So what you do is you burst up into the cloud. So Cassandra, as I said earlier, is completely vendor agnostic. You can install it in any of the major cloud providers or any cloud providers or whatever. But you can do that within a single database. So I could just have multiple data centers that span the cloud providers, whether that's for bursting up whether that's because I want to leverage some capability that maybe like Google Cloud has or Azure has or something. Um, maybe that's also for leverage. We're actually seeing that more and more and more where people will distribute their, their database amongst multiple cloud providers for leverage 
Um, so that way, if any one cloud provider, say, ups their cost too much or something, they can just move away. And it, it doesn't cost them really any downtime, right? Um, so any of those combinations, whether it is on-prem, hybrid, where it's both on-prem and cloud, or it's a multi-cloud, you can totally do that with Cassandra. David, one question uh, from yes. Stephen Chu uh, on the previous slide, if you back up one, um, he was <laughs> curious, doesn't it repair itself by restoring the failed node? Excuse me. It doesn't repair itself by restoring the failed node, but rather by making it replicated on some other node, question mark. Yeah, so there's a couple of things going on here. Um, so part of what's going to happen, and, and this actually gets into something with consistency level there. Okay, so let me step back. There's a mechanism called anti-entropy repair. These are the repairs that are happening in the background, uh, totally separate from what I just talked about with hints and separate from the types of consistency level that you use. Uh, so, so what this means is, um, Cassandra with its repair mechanisms is always constantly checking. And if it sees that for some reason, a particular node has stale data, it'll automatically repair that data. Um, the hint mechanism is a, another repair mechanism that again, is specific to if a node is down. Um, and then right. if you're that, using- That's kind of happening at the coordinator front door yes. level, right? Whereas yes, like that's right. the background repair is going around and spot checking stuff as a yes. background. That's right, that's right, that's right. Um, yeah, so the coordinator one is really kind of the front door. I like how you put that actually. That yeah, it's a more directed repair because it the coordinator detected, hey, a node is down. I'm gonna hold on to this until it's back, kind of thing. Um, and then there's also another type of repair called the read repair uh, that happens if you use um, consistency level. I'm not really talking about that here, but we can totally get into it. If you use a consistency level of quorum or higher, then every time you do a read, it'll actually do a digest. It's gonna it's gonna check like a checksum. It's going to compare against the other nodes that own that token range. And if it sees any inconsistencies, it'll automatically repair that data as well. So there's all these mechanisms that are in play. Um, I hope Steven, um, if that answers it, because to your question, by making it replicated on some other nodes, yes, since you have multiple copies of the data, now that's where I can use something like the read repair and stuff to automatically re repair the data if it sees anything. Again, if I did a replication factor of one, a read repair wouldn't make much sense. I've only got one copy of the data, right? So this is, again, one of those cases where the standard is to use a replication factor of three. Now I've got multiple nodes that have that. And now if something does happen, well, I have two other nodes that have the data. So once that node comes back on, they're going to get the data. Hopefully, let me know if that answers your question. And uh, I, will, I will move on for now. OK. So you know, if you're thinking about, okay, well, what kind of use cases does Cassandra fit for, right? Um, I'm just going to put all these on the page, actually. We'll just talk about them all in one shot. Um, if you look on the very right, those are, these are the sweet spots. It doesn't mean these, this is not an exhaustive list. This is not an absolute list saying anything outside of this doesn't fit, but these are the sweet spots for the Cassandra. So if you're talking about things that have need a lot of scalability, if you've got high throughput, heavy writes, heavy reads, uh, internet, you know, IoT, event streaming, log analytics, total sweet spot for Cassandra. Um, mission critical, right? If you can imagine from the resiliency standpoint, robustness, um, it is called the always on database, um, you know, for, for a reason. Um, we actually see a ton of applications of many of, matter of fact, I love this part, you know, like something like 90% of the Fortune 100 companies all use Cassandra. You pick up your phone, look at your apps, Uber, Instagram, uh, Spotify, Siri, Apple's actually one of the largest, has one of the largest Cassandra clusters in the world, uh, next to Alibaba, which is another one. Um, Sony PlayStation, that's sort of net, um, Netflix, right? If you think of all the little interactions that are going on Netflix, the recommendations, the pause plays and things from millions of people all over the place, that's totally Cassandra. And part of the reason why they do this is because of the mission critical piece critical piece and its ability to keep its performance at scale. Um, we talked about the distributed piece uh, there as well, you know, you can use its data centers uh, to distribute your data. I should also mention that those hints that I talked about, that happens at the data center level as well. So if you have multiple data centers and they're replicating across and a whole data center like goes down, we saw in the last how many years, every one of the major cloud providers had full region failures, right? That could be your data center. But if you had multiple data centers, guess what? As requests are coming in, those that other data center will also store hints and replay those on the data center that was down. And when it comes back up, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll handle that there as well. All right. David, just one quick comment. I think a lot yeah, of people think 
of NoSQL databases, and they're like, oh, well, I can't use that as the OLTP database or the or the database underneath my customer facing system because you know there's no transactions or it's not asset or blah blah blah. blah oh right. Know? And it's like, and it's like, well, um, you know, it turns out a lot of people are you know using Cassandra for these sorts of mission critical workloads. Absolutely. And you know, the one we get all the time is there's like, there's no way banks would do this. There are more credit cards and banks <laughs> that use Cassandra. Um, yeah. As a matter of fact, it ends up being a, a funnily, a strangely odd good replacement for mainframes. Um, but that the whole idea of, well, then how do you, how do you, you know, um, how do you handle like, uh, you know, a bank transaction? It has to be absolute. Um, Patrick, uh, Patrick McFadden, you may, may or may not know the name. He's always said, and I, I love this quote from him, that banks have been eventually consistent forever. I mean, if you think about it, you know, you, you deposit your check into the ATM and your account balance might reflect that, but the check hasn't actually been processed just yet, right? You know, and then eventually uh, they do that. They've actually been using this, this format for a long time, but we actually have a ton of banks uh, that use it and banks that everybody uses and knows and such. So um, it, is, it is not something, uh, it's not a database that's excluded from that or, or anything along the lines, that's for sure. Okay, so the next section here, getting now into some of the basic components, things like tables, partitions, and all that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just going to start at the ground level, and we're going to build it up real quick. Um, so the basic structure is going to be a cell. It's just an intersection uh, between a row and a column, right? So you see here, I have a single cell of data with something in it, like John. Uh, then a row, right? And again, if you've done anything ever with like an Excel spreadsheet or a database ever, a tabular database, you're probably very familiar with this. Um, but you know, I'm going to have a row. It's going to be multiple related cells, right? So in this case, um, I have each cell one John Doe in wizardry. Now where it starts to get more interesting is with partitions, right? We've talked about Cassandra, you know, you have this partition key and Cassandra distributes partitions automatically, but what does that actually mean? So if you start taking a look at this, now in this particular example, I have three rows. In this, just, you know, I just believe me, I say that we're setting the department here as a partition key. So when you create a table, we're gonna look at this later, you have to set at least one column as a partition key, right? You have to do that, it's a requirement. So we're saying here, department is going to be my partition key. What I want you to notice is that in this case, every one of those is wizardry. They're all the same partition, right? That means that this data will be physically stored together on disk. So that's a really important concept to understand from a Cassandra standpoint. Now, what happens then if I have multiple you know, I have different values for my partition key like I do here. Instead of all being wizardry, these three, three, three rows have wizardry, dark magic, and devrel. These three rows in this single logical table will actually be stored in three physical different partitions, right? These could actually be in three completely different nodes in my cluster. And when I actually select star from this table, it would actually grab the data from those three different nodes for these three different partitions. Now, I'm not saying it has to be on three different nodes. It just could be. Right. So I just want you to really kind of understand this here that in this case, if I have multiple rows that have the same partition key, they will actually be stored in the same physical partition, where if they have different partition keys, they will be stored in different physical partitions. And you'll and see, by the way, this is, oh, yeah, go ahead. Rum in the chat wins the question of the, of the webinar award uh, for, for <laughs> asking a question. Uh, nailed it, Rum. Look, look at what he asked. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, how do we decide the number of nodes needed in a ring? You know, a lot of that's going to come down to what your SLAs are going to be and your, the throughput that you expect, right? So one of the things you're going to obviously want to do, uh, unless you're coming at it completely green, uh, you have no idea, you know, it's a brand new project, you may not have any idea of what kind of throughput you might expect, you know, then then you kind of do some tests and you, and you kind of figure it out and you, you plan for what that is. But it really comes down to, if you remember I said earlier, that each individual node can handle many thousands of transactions a second per core, right? So maybe what you do is you start with a three node cluster and then you, you, know, you get your data model going. How much data are you gonna have? What's the size of the data? All sorts of things, right? Um, just like you would in a relational database, but then you start to test and you start to figure out, well, what are your SLAs? Uh, you know, are they a second? Are they a millisecond? What are they, right? And that is gonna start to determine how many nodes you might need, you know, and it, uh, part of that also depends on how you vertically scale them. So there is some work to do from that standpoint. The cool thing though, is that you're, you don't have to just start there. Um, I'm going to talk about some stuff later 
there are some tools, there are some things that you can use that you can just experiment on for free and start to get that feel and start to kind of work out what that throughput might, requirement might be. Um, and then that'll start to give you a better idea of how many nodes you need. Okay. All right. Yeah. And of, and of course, oh, let's see. Yeah, of course, Ram. All right. All right. So moving on now, looking at, if we take a step back and, and looking at, you know, what's a key space? What's a table? So in Cassandra, a key space is pretty much the same thing as like a database or a schema in the relational world. It's just a container of the tables, right? It's also where you set replication. Um, so that all that replication I talked about, you literally set with one command when you create your key space, that handles all of the replication automatically. It's, it's really powerful for such a simple thing, right? But generally, the key space is your container of tables. And then in the tables, uh, you know, they have rows and columns, just like we would in a relational database. Um, the only difference is now you have this concept of partitions. So let's take a look at a concrete example, because I like these better. I, I find them to be much more informative. So, okay. So we have a key space called Kidler Video. Now, by the way, the, the, the model that you're going to see here is actually comes from um, uh, uh, one of the reference apps that we build and the Abaca team called Killer Video. It's like YouTube Lite, right? So think about it like a YouTube kind of app. Um, so we have this key space called Killer Video that's going to contain all the tables that are relevant to Killer Video. Uh, in this case, I have a table called Users by City. Now, there's a convention here. I'm saying that I want to retrieve users partitioned by city. So you'll find in Cassandra, if you see by, and then whatever words come after that, that's what we're partitioning by. So I'm telling you in the table name how I'm partitioning the data. So if you notice then in our table here, the first thing, that first column is city, right? You see it's labeled as my partition key column. So I'm partitioning by city. I have two cities, Phoenix and Seattle. Those are my two physical partitions. And then in each of those, you see that I have multiple rows. Now I don't have to. I could have a single row par partition, or I could have uh, what's called a multi-row partition, like we see here. Um, it just depends on, on the particular need in the data model. What I want to point out, though, is look at last name and first name. Notice they're labeled clustering columns. You see there at the bottom. So clustering columns are used for order or uniqueness. So I can use that to order my data, or I can use that to determine, you know, to help uh, with having a unique primary key. Um, when you use it for order, something really cool about clustering columns. Cassandra is all about being optimized to perform at scale and maintain its SLAs at scale. You're going to hear me say that a bunch. So what that means is when I am ordering data in Cassandra, it's actually being ordered on the right in memory where it's fastest. And when it gets flushed out to disk later on, it's already stored in that ordered format. So what that means is later on when I read the data, I'm already getting it in its ordered format. I don't pay the cost for the read at at the read. Or, I'm sorry, I don't pay the cost for the order <laughs> at the read, uh, like I would say in a relational database. So it's an optimization that's specifically to, to increase the, you know, to or reduce the latency of read operations. Um, and notice, if you take a look at last name for Phoenix there, notice Helson Lastfall Smith, right? It's naturally ordered. So for any types that can be naturally ordered, things like an int, timestamp, strings, whatever, then it will automatically order the data. So when you pull it out later, you get it in that order format. Anything else that is not a partition key column or a clustering column is just my data, my payload, right? So address and email in this case are my, my data payload effectively. All right. Okay, so CQL is the language that we use uh, in Cassandra, much like SQL. It is actually a subset of SQL. Syntactically, it's going to look almost identical to it. Of course, there are some differences. It's a completely different type of database than a relational database. Um, but if you've done stuff with relational databases, this should look awfully familiar. Um, so if I want to create some table, I'm going to say create table. I've got my key space dot my table name. I'm then going to have a set of my columns, what their types are. And the key thing here, though, the, the thing that is really important is that primary key. The purpose of the primary key is to define a unique row, right? Now, in a, in a table in Cassandra, you always have to provide at least one partition key. It is required that have to have it. So in this case, we're partitioning by city. Anything after that is a clustering column. Now, notice the parens around city. I can have, um, if you're asking, well, can you have composite partition keys? Yes, you absolutely can. Uh, that's where those parens come into play. But it's actually just a nice convention to use regardless, so there's no confusion. If you see the parens, there's your partition key. And here I thought you were going to say that the most critical thing is the semicolon at the end. Oh, is that true? That is true. You know, you know, to that point, it's actually really funny. If you're in a CQL shell or something like that, 
and you type a SQL command without the semicolon, you'll get dot, dot, dot. And I've had more than one person who said, when's it going to finish? Like, it looks like it's just, and I'm like, okay, okay that, that makes sense. No, you need that semicolon. Yeah, it's not going to let you do it if you don't. <laughs> um, so, so as I mentioned before, the primary key is there to ensure uniqueness, right? Uh, so if you look at the examples that I have there at the bottom, um, notice that first one. I'm partitioning by city, but then I'm clustering by last name, first name, and email. Imagine for a moment if I didn't have last name, first name, and email. I just partitioned by city. Well, okay, I have a row for Seattle, and then I insert another row for Seattle. What's it going to do? It's just going to upsert. It's going to overwrite the previous one, right? That's not unique at that point. So I add in last name and first name. Well, then what happens if I have Jane Doe in Orlando, and then I have another Jane Doe in Orlando? They're going to upsert, right? It's not unique. So that's where email comes into play. Ah, okay, you, email is generally going to be unique. For, for names, right? So now I could have two Jane Doe's in Orlando, but they're gonna have different emails. So I'm, I wanna ensure uniqueness, right? Um, and then the one on the bottom there, that user ID, simple enough. Now, by the way, in Cassandra for user or for IDs, we tend to use UUIDs. I'm gonna talk more about why this is. Uh, so you don't get collisions with ints and stuff. Like I said, I'll, I'll talk about it. Um, but a UUID is gonna be unique, right? So that's actually a good example of, if I'm using something like a UUID for a user ID, I'm pretty much guaranteed that's gonna be unique. So that's that's a good example. Now, as I mentioned before, um, but the partition key, its role, it just it's what you're partitioning your rows by. That's what that's about, right? So again, the examples I just mentioned, the user ID, or maybe the one on the bottom there where I'm partitioning by uh, video IDs. And again, um, you know, if I have a case in say YouTube uh, where I want to view a particular video, and I of course maybe want to see the comments that go along with that video or something like that, um, well. I, I can just pass in the ID of that one video. I'm going to partition by each individual video. They'll have their own partition. Now, I mentioned clustering columns before can be used for ordering or uniqueness. So take a look at the first example, right? I mentioned this one earlier, um, where if you notice the one with the red X, where it doesn't have email, again, if I had two Jane Doe's in the same city or Orlando, that's not unique, right? I would cause an upsert if I had subsequent mutations or inserts on Jane Doe in Orlando. Uh, so I can use a clustering column and add something like email. Now I'm making that row unique. Um, so the primary key is not just about the partition key, you know, unless partition key itself is actually unique. But in this case, I'm using the whole set of columns in the primary key to ensure a unique row. On the bottom one, uh, this is where we're talking about sorting. So imagine for a second that I have a video in YouTube but I'm not sorting it at all by any kind of time-based order. And so then when I pull the comments up, they just come in random order. That might look really weird, right? Because conversations happen in a time-based order. Um, so I don't want those to show up randomly. So in that very bottom example with the green check mark, you see we added created at as a clustering column. Now I mentioned before, clustering columns are going to automatically order on a type like a timestamp. Um, so that means that I will naturally get my data in ordered, you know, in an ordered time. Uh, format. So in the bottom one, now that I've added a timestamp in that case, um, that's where it's being sorted. You could argue, well, isn't common ID a clustering column? Isn't it being ordered? But it's a UUID. So there's not really a, an order to the UUIDs, right? Um, so it's it's really looking at ordering on those types that, that make sense to actually order by something. David, a uh, question from yes. Stephen Chu, uh, another good one. Um, yep. So if you decide later you need to add a column as a cluster yeah. key, yeah, ah. you do that. Good question. Uh, no, uh, no. In that case, you cannot. Once you have established the primary key of a table in Cassandra, you cannot just go and change that primary key. Why? Because the primary key in Cassandra, if you remember how partitions are that base unit of access, and that that literally determines the physical location of where that data is going to exist in your cluster. If you change the primary key at all, you've now just changed that address, right? Um, so if you, that what you're talking about is what we call schema evolution, right? So it's a case where maybe you have an existing table, you have a certain schema and they're like, oh, okay, we need to add this. We need to cluster by this or something. At that point, you, there's a couple options. You'd either need to create a, a new table with that new clustering column and then migrate the data over. Um, but if, if you needed the old one to exist, you know, you could, you could go about it certain ways as well, but no, you would not be able to simply add a clustering column to an existing table 
uh, with data. You would have to you would have to create a new table. I think I saw something else come in. There before we go on to that, um, you yeah. know, there are uh, there are ways you can create secondary indexes and stuff like that, but that's a different, yes, right? Yes, so you there are there are no options to, to evolve. A that's schema. right. Yeah, yeah. No, there are there are options for you. It really depends on what your particular use case is. What are your SLAs, right? Um, you know, anytime you index in Cassandra, you're you're you know you're indexing for convenience, not for performance, right? Cassandra is optimized. It's the way that we do things in Cassandra is to ensure that you're maintaining those tight SLAs no matter what scale you're at, right? Now, if you start to use indexes and stuff, those are great. They're actually very flexible. There's some really cool stuff you can you can do with them. But now you're starting to step away from that base level of performance that you might expect, right? Um, so if your use case, though, if your SLA says, hey, that's fine, cool, right? But if your use case says, well, I need to make sure that I have a, you know, two millisecond read every single time, you're probably going to create another table at that point. Brilliant. Nice. Okay, cool. And then Rom uh, has a question. Let's see. If a ring TF, uh, right, transition per second equals 100,000. If we have three rings in different locations, then my transaction per second might be 300,000. What happens if I'm putting a writing to each ring at the same time? Right. So it depends on how you are using those rings. Um, and it depends on what your intent is. Um, if you, and when you say rings, I assume you're meaning data centers, right? Uh, so if you do, let me know. Um, yes, perfect. Okay, so if you are if you are splitting data amongst data centers, and your goal is a geographic distribution, then you're not going to increase. You're not just going to additively increase your throughput, um, your your, your um, throughput per second. Um, when as you, um, how do I want to explain this? Let's say if you have the same number of nodes in each ring. Let's just say it's like three nodes in each ring, right? and they are being used for geographic distribution, then the way that I'm going to set that up is such where I am only going to be writing to a local data center with those three nodes and letting it replicate to the other ones. So that means that my throughput is going to be based off those three nodes, not nine nodes, right? Um, where if I want to increase the throughput, then I'm going to start to increase the nodes into individual rings. Um, now, you know, honestly, you could say, well, you know, um, is there, if I wasn't doing geographic separation, if I just put them next to each other or something like that, um, really, what you're really going to do is you want to increase the number of nodes in an individual data center to increase its throughput, right? That's what you're looking for. Anytime you start splitting on data centers, now you're not going to increase the throughput of the whole cluster, right? You're going to increase some of the capabilities and how you distribute data and you know and such like that. So if you want to increase the throughput, you're going to add nodes to individual data centers. I hope that distinction makes sense there. So oh, and he said at the same. Got it. Okay, cool. Oh, and will this impact replication across rings? So that's a wonderful question. As you add nodes, this is actually really neat. This is why the replication factor is actually so important. Um, a question I get a lot is, well, if I have like a thousand nodes, do I set my replication factor to a thousand? No. No, three is cool. Some might go five. If you do anything, make sure you keep it in an odd, you know, a, a prime or a, no, just odd, not primes. Yeah, no, no. And that, that's why I said um, in the comments earlier, the primary replica, the secondary replica, and the oh, bleep replica. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, yeah, the replication across data center. So even if you had, a, let's pretend you had, you know, a thousand nodes per data center or something like that, right? At a replication factor of three, you're still only replicating the three nodes, right? Um, and the replication, so in any data that comes in to an individual node, yes, that's going to get replicated out. You do need one thing you do need, to, and I think this is where maybe you're going, Ram, is one of the things that you do need to ensure that you have in Cassandra between data centers is a good pipe, right? Because there at times, depending on how much you have going on, you can definitely have some network traffic going. Um, so, uh, but if you keep your replication factor down, you're not going to be doing this amazing amount of replication. You know, you don't need to have be like a replication factor of 50 or something like that. So I, I usually think talking about across data center as opposed to yes. within the cluster. Yes, no, and, and I am as well. Um, okay. Okay. Because okay. depending on, yeah, because depending on, it depends on how you're replicating across and what kind of consistency you're using. We haven't really talked about that part. Um, so when you have multiple data centers, there are local variants of your consistency levels. So like local quorum, local one. What that means is 
I want to replicate to my local data center and then, then just let Cassandra handle the replication, right? Um, or if I did it at Quorum or, or One or something without the local, I'm actually going to then just replicate across all of my data centers automatically, right? Like right there, right within the operation that I'm trying to perform um, and, and everything. So it depends on what you're trying to do. In either one of those cases, um, I, if I'm going to replicate across multiple data centers and uh, you know, if I have some data coming in, yes, it's of course going to be replicated across. It's just a different case of uh, what you, the amount of acknowledgements you need, to, uh, the amount of nodes you need to acknowledge those right the, before. Those are the levers. The, the point is that it's yes. flexible enough to do either, yes. right? If, yes. If you want it to cascade throughout the entire gosh darn network, all the way across the globe, you can, or if you just want right. to contain it within your, with your local cluster, you can. But the point is, is that options exist on both sides, right? And it's up to, it's yep. up to you how immediate yep. and consistent you want the data to make, but we provide those capabilities for you. You just need yeah. to use what Yeah, you and want. to to and to Ram to what I think what I'm getting at is you grow as you grow the amount of nodes that you have, you grow the amount of data that's coming in, you grow the throughput in individual data centers. If you are replicating to other data centers, yes, that's going to increase increase the replication demands across because you have more data coming across the pipe more often. If that's I think that's what you're let's see. Yeah, I would say I would say again. Since um, oh, and and so everybody can see it uh, with Ram's questions. Should replication across data centers also be considered while calculating TPS to decide nodes in a ring? Um, I would say really, um, it it comes down um, more to um, the individual. When you're thinking about TPS, think about the individual data center. You may need to grow your pipe. You need may need to take that into consideration if you are replicating all of that across data centers for sure. But when it comes to the actual TPS, um, especially if you're using the local variants, which I absolutely recommend that you do, because if you had a geographic distribution, you don't want uh, your application over in uh, the US to be reading constantly from China, right, for something. You want it to read its local data center. So it's really up to the individual data centers and, and the TPS for the individual data centers, if that makes sense. All right. Cool. All right. Replication's complicated. Let, let's make sure we get to the, the it does, rest of the. By the way, by the way, everything <laughs> that we are talking about right now, we have all sorts of. If you want to really dig into it, I know we're getting into the weeds a little bit, and and you know I actually appreciate that. By the way, um, everything we're talking about here, we have all sorts of free content, courses, materials, and everything. If you want to dig in, I have stuff for you. I'm going to give you at the end. You can really dig in and get into this. Sweet. All right. Yes, and of course, thank you for the question, Ram. Um, OK, so rules of a good partition. Uh, so in Cassandra, everything is about that partition. You Later on, you want to you wanna optimize to do the, you want to perform the fewest amount of, you know, you want the, the least amount of IO possible per read, right? Your goal is per any given query, you just want to read a single partition and have it return that partition back. That is going to be the fastest, fastest kind of thing that's going to you know, return. Um, so the, the point of that is you want to store together what you retrieve together. What do I mean by that? Take a look at the examples here. Look at that top one. So here, imagine going back to YouTube, I pull up a video. And when I pull up a video, I want to see all of its comments, right? So what I'm saying here is in this case, I want to be able to get that all in one read. So here, I'm actually going to store uh, for a particular, I'm going to partition by video ID. And then I'm going to score, store all the comments for that particular video in that, in that same partition. That way, later on, when I read that one partition for that one video ID, one read, boom, I get the whole set of data back. If you look at the example on the bottom, the one with common ID and created at, imagine I have a video that has a thousand comments, right? But instead of storing it in a single partition, I'm actually now storing a thousand different comment partitions that when I pull up that one video, I now have to iterate through and query for all a thousand of those, right? That is terribly inefficient compared to being able to just get it in, in a single read, right? So that's what we mean by store together what you retrieve together. It sounds like you just kind of hit on the, the essence of the difference between the relational model and this model, right? You know, yes, <laughs> this right? Is, and it's like, this is definitely, this is yes. Why, right? This is, this is what allows us to get beyond, you know, uh, paying a gazillion dollars a node for Oracle Rack, right? That's right. It, it, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, and by the way, that we're going to get into that. We're going to totally get into that part of it. Um, so another thing is you want to avoid big partitions. Technically, the partitions I've seen 
partitions of immense sizes, like many, many, many gigabytes per partition. And Cassandra will let you do it. Just like Unix will let you do just about anything until you completely hose yourself. Cassandra will allow you to do the same thing. So here are the general guidelines. Generally speaking, you don't want any more than 100,000 rows in a partition. And you don't want a, an individual partition to be bigger than 100 megabytes. If you start to come, come to those constraints, that's where you want to start to do what we call bucketing or split it up. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. So the thing here is you want to avoid particularly large partitions. That, that first example um, with the video ID and the comments, you know, how many comments do you usually have per video? Maybe if you have a particularly, you know, popular one, thousands maybe, will you have 100,000 comments in a video? If you do regularly, maybe you want to break that up a little bit, right? But generally that's probably okay. But if you look at the example there on the bottom, notice country. Imagine a country like India and you're storing all the users in India compared to say like Iceland, right? But a country like India is going to just be this huge partition well past 100,000 rows in a partition, right? So that's a case that's where you want to kind of stay away from that. You want to you want to figure out, okay, if I do need to partition by country, I probably need to also partition by something else or cluster by something else to keep that partition a little bit smaller. You also want question, to avoid- The question oh, yeah. was, uh, can we compress any of the data? You know, you technically can on disk. I don't think it's a very good idea. Cassandra is built, part of why how Cassandra does what it does is by fast disk, right? You do He's not- He's clarifying, do not, by the way. He's clarifying oh. in, the, in the chat. Oh, um, yeah, I guess, you know, you'd, you'd probably have to do that on yourself. I don't know of any, um, I, I just may not be aware of it. I don't know of any actual compression, you know, within a, a column or, or something like that itself. You, you could do that on your own. Uh, and and then just store it in that format. I, I could see that. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm not saying that there isn't. I just don't know of one. That's all. That that's something I have to actually go look up. Um, so one thing you also want to do is avoid unbounded partitions. I mentioned earlier Cassandra's sweet spot. One of the sweet spots is IoT, right? An IoT use case. So here we have an IoT use case. I have, you know, a sensor ID is my uh, partition key and then report it at. I'm going to say record sensor data every 10 seconds or something like that. Great. This is an IoT use case. Wonderful. Here's the problem. It's completely unbounded. How much data, if I'm recording data for every sensor that I have in my network, every 10 seconds, how much data am I going to have after a month, after a year, right? It's, it's just going to just continue to grow and grow and grow. So that's why this is a, a bad pattern. So then what we do with this, for a case like this, is what we call bucketing. This is really, all I'm doing is I'm just going to bifurcate my partition. I'm just going to partition by something else as well to then cap how much that partition is going to grow. So if you look at the example I just added, we have our sensor ID, right? But now I added a month year. So I'm going to cap the amount of sensor data I can get by month. So now, now I know exactly what my sizing is going to be. Right? If I'm reporting data every 10 seconds per sensor, I can size that out properly. And I'm not going to have an unbounded partition case. And by the way, month year in this case we used. Why? Because you don't want to all of a sudden start upserting data after a year goes by and you start repeating the month. Right? You want to make sure you have that in there. That's why that little tidbit's there. Nice. And then the last, and the last one is to avoid hot partitions. So hot partitions and big partitions can be related. If you look at the example very at the very bottom, going back to India again with country and user ID, well, imagine if I had a country like India, a partition by, like India, and a partition like Iceland. India is, you know, if I had all the users, um, it's going to be significantly larger than that of Iceland, right? There's just a lot more people, like orders of magnitude more people. So that, you know, if all things are equal and the amount of user interaction I have is, is equal, then there's a very good chance that my India partition is just beginning, it's going to be getting hit over and over and over and over. It's going to unbalance my cluster. Why? Because now I'm going to have a small subset of nodes that are getting the lion's share of all the work, right? Because Sandra works best when the data is distributed equally around my nodes, right? So you want to avoid those types of cases. Um, that middle one there with the question mark, it's a question mark because, you know, let's say that you have a celebrity or a really particularly popular video, you might have a video that's getting hit over and over and over and over and over, right? So again, if you have that kind of factor or something, then that's something you need to think about um, in your data model. Jason, is there a question asked, that, let's see. 
J Jason asked a really good question about the downside of just having the whole primary key to, uh, key as your partition. Oh, great question. Yeah. So every column you add into your partition key in Cassandra, you must include in your where clause. And there are no range queries that you can perform. They must be an exact match. So you could technically have a primary key that had four columns, right, as all part of your part, you know, four partition key columns uh, as a composite. But then that means your where clause will have to say, you know, where column one equals and column two equals and column three equals and column four equals every single time you query. If that fits your data model, wonderful, right? Um, but if that doesn't gain you some of the flexibility, like a clustering column, I can actually do a range on. Let's say I have a clustering column by timestamp. I could actually say in that, in the case of the middle there with created at, I could say, you know, where video ID equals and created at, you know, greater than some time and less than some other time. So it gives me some more flexibility in the kind of data I can return. Um, but if they are all partition keys, then I will have to I will have to do an exact match for them all the time. So that's so you can. There's no reason why you can't. It depends on your use case, depends on your data model and, and what works for you. David, I have a question. Uh, and yes. it's not a rhetorical, it's not a rhetorical Let's one. Let's do it. Uh, Let's do it. You know, if if the, the all these things that you're talking about seem to really uh, imply a command and a knowledge uh, for me as a developer of the data set in question. Um, okay. what do you like mm -hmm. what do you typically recommend to to developers you talk to? That are working with Cassandra about like how should they explore the data set they have? Um, you know what what uh, what are some third party things that they use maybe to get familiar with the data set they do have? And this of course presumes that it's not a greenfield application where you don't necessarily know all these things about your data set yet, right? Yeah, there are multiple answers to that. Um, I think part of I, I'm going to try to read your mind a little bit here and answer what I think. Um, I think that the multiple aspects of what you're asking are one to me is going to be when I say get when when you say get to know your data set, um, I think about that in terms of well, how is a particular data model going to perform, and yes. how do I know what to partition by and such yes. like that. Exactly. Um, yes. There are tools uh, out there, open source by the way, um, like NoSQL Bench that are for this exact purpose. Um, that you can, matter of fact, we can drop a link to that if you if you want to go find it, Peter. <laughs> it is it's just NoSQL Bench. I think it's. Uh, Dot com or dot io or something like that. Yeah, um, this allows you to what if a little bit over your. Over it your does list. exactly, and NoSQL Bench was really cool about it. Um, is it will, it will determine deterministically. That's an easy word for me to say. Generate your data, so you can say, okay, here's what my data looks like, and then you can go go make a billion of those, right? And you can see how that performs and everything like that. So that's. That's all I was getting at. You oh. read my mind. Oh, was that it? Okay, okay. Because the other part, you know, there are some tools. Some may ask, like, well, how do I know what what size my partitions are going to be? Or like, there are actually there is a um there are a couple uh, Cassandra calculators that are out there. If you literally look up Cassandra calculator, you'll probably find them. One of them is a Heroku app that someone wrote um, that will help you do that very thing, where you can start to put in, you know, what's my what are my types? How much data do I think I'm going to have in them? And it'll start to help you kind of partition that. What's my replication factor? How much data that will be? Um, so there's that as well. But yeah, NoSQL Bench is totally a tool, uh, one tool to take a look at if you want to, um, uh, if you want to Please. start to test and you know test performance and everything. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Now, by the way, I know that we're at like 9:30. Um, I know that we have we've got some time. Um, I just want to get a gut check real quick. Uh, with the rest of the stuff, do you want me to just, do y'all want me to just keep going with the stuff or do you want to speed up something or what? I think we've got a good 30 minutes left. So in absence of yeah. comments, I want to let, well, let people know as you're considering the answer to, to, to David's question uh, that we are going to talk a little bit about how you use the Java developer, you know, interact uh, yep. with that. We're getting, we're getting to that real soon. Yeah. That's coming right up. Yeah, so for the for those of you who are like, I, this is intro to Cassandra Forge of Java developers with the Java part, it's totally coming. I got to build up the Cassandra part first. And you guys are all asking wonderful questions, by the way. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Plus one of that. Plus one of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so let's move into the data modeling, the art of data modeling, right? This gets into the fun, right? And this is actually part of where I thought you were going with your question, Peter, um, with like, how do I get to know my data and how do I model it? Because, you know, we're talking about all these things about like these, these good partition strategies and such, but then 
you know, how do I even start off in this process, right? And yeah. this is where it's a little bit different from how we do things in a relational world. But my goal is by the time I'm done doing this little part that you're going to go, oh, oh, that's not so bad, right? And it's not. Once you, actually, once you get used to it, it's, it, it's really kind of natural for application developers. So let's talk about it. So two terms that if you don't know, you should know uh, that we're going to talk about right now. Um, in the database world, right? Normalization and denormalization. So normalization, for those of us familiar, again, with relational databases, this is the way that we've been doing things for decades, where you're really looking to reduce the amount of data redundancy that you have and improve your data integrity, um, where you go through a process of applying normal forms to some data model, right? Uh, or, or I'm sorry, to, to some set of data that you use then to generate your data model. And you know you end up with a set of you know or a set of like you know entity tables and such and things like foreign keys and joins between it right. Um, but the key thing to take away from this is in the relational model, if I have a set of employees and I have a set of departments they're a part of, I'm most likely going to represent those in two different tables, right? The key thing is I want to reduce that data redundancy, so I'm only going to have a single instance of each. Thing, right? So in the case of employees, I'll have a single instance. Each row will be one of my employees. In the case of departments, I'll have a single instance. Each row will be a department. I don't repeat the data or anything like that, right? Um, and there are some pros to this, right? There are some pros. Writes are really simple. If I want to add a department, I just, boom, I just add a department to the department table. And then guess what? I've already got my foreign keys and everything. I have my relationships. Uh, and then it's you know kind of a no-brainer uh, to to make that connection to other tables that may be using the departments table. Um, data integrity is is pretty clear from that standpoint. If I already have an engineering value in my department, my relational database is probably going to come back and say, "Hey, you already got that, right? You you can't have that again." Some of the cons though is that reads, especially as you scale up. How many people here have had like you know, a, a 20 table nested join that, you know, either you're the DBA or the DBA is trying to optimize or as an application developer, you're like, you know, is there any better way I can do this, right? But all those Cartesian joins start adding up um, and, and it can translate into slow reads, right? And your, comp your queries can get seriously complex. Um, and that was actually one thing back, I, I've worn both hats. I've, I've been a DBA. I've also, you know, been an application developer. Um, and I, in both cases, I, I remember you know being a badge of honor to try to optimize some of these queries. They can get seriously complex, right? Uh, but again, on the pros, writes are pretty simple. You've got that inherent data integrity there. Now, from the denormalization standpoint, that's really meant for read performance. Anyone here done any data warehousing? You've probably flattened out data or denormalized it. Why? Because you want your reads to be faster, and that's what it's about. This, by the way, no, uh, no surprise probably at this point, this is what Cassandra does, right? Now, here's the key difference, though, where when we use normalization in our normal forms, we're reducing data redundancy. In the case of denormalized tables, we're not, right? So notice what we did here. In the previous example, we have two different tables of employees and departments with single instances for, for each one of our uh, rows. But in a Cassandra table, I flatten it out. So now we've combined both employees and departments. And notice for Edgar Codd, I have engineering. But for the second row, Raymond Boyce, I also have engineering. I just repeated the data, right? So this is where it starts to get a little bit different. And what's really cool here, this is where one of the big comparisons between how Cassandra does things and how relational databases come into play. When relational databases were created, how many decades ago now, right? Uh, God, is it almost 50 years or something? I think, something like that. Um, uh, think about disk speed back then and the size of disks. You'd have like a five megabyte platter that was like this big, you know, with this big spindle on it. They were terribly slow, right? You you didn't, you couldn't just repeat data, right? You know, they had to be designed in, in a way to use the technology at the time. At the time that you know, SQL databases were created and Cassandra was created, it was a whole different ball game. And nowadays we have SSDs, which are significantly faster. They don't have the seek time penalties that spinning disks do. Right, and you, you know, compared to memory, compared to CPU, compared to all the other stuff, they're the cheapest commodity right now, and they're actually quite fast. So Cassandra makes a trade-off. The trade-off is I'm going to use more and faster disk to be able to store data in this flattened out format to optimize my read performance. That's what we're doing here. Now there are some pros. 
I'm optimizing on read performance. My queries are uber simple. I don't have joins. There are no joins whatsoever in Cassandra, right? So when I read something, I'm just going to read, you know, in, from, a, from a given table. Now, there are some cons, though. In this case, imagine if I have multiple tables that all need departments. Now I have multiple rights. Every time I update for a new department or something like that or matting, and now I've got a right to multiple tables, right? And my, my integrity, my, my data integrity is actually manual. It puts the onus on the developer. Um, so it's the trade-off, though. This is the, the trade-off that we're making. I saw some questions. No, I saw we're going to we we gotta pick up some speed here. Um, got it. I Let's think. do it. Yeah, so right, we're no. going to defer more questions until the end so that we... You know what I'm going to do then? Because I want to get to the Java stuff for the Java folks. I'm going to talk about this next part here. I'm going to skip over the application workflow part, and then I'm going to get right to the other stuff so those right. folks have that. And if we have time and our folks want to go back to it, I'll go back to the, to the application workflow part. Sounds good. Perfect. Nailed it. Okay. So, so here's what this comes down to. In the relational data model flow, we start with our data. We use our normal forms. We model the data, right? We come up with our schema, our ERD, and stuff like that. Then as application developers, what do we do? We reference that schema. We figure out what tables we need to put together and join. We create our queries for the application, how we need them. In Cassandra, we literally flip it on its head. We start with our application workflows. We use that to generate our data model. And then we you know, apply our data. So it flips it. It completely flips the flow, right? Um, and the question I get here a lot is, does this mean I need to know my queries up front? And the answer is yes, before you think I'm crazy. Um, my, my argument to you, and the part I'm going to skip for a moment here, uh, is that the moment you start even, say, writing out your you know, kind of like, like putting a UI in a, a napkin, you are literally generating your application workflow. You can use application workflows alone to generate your queries and your tables and everything, right? OK, so with that, I just want to get that paradigm in there, right? Um, so it, it changes the game uh, from this standpoint. All right, so I'm going to skip this section for now. Boop, boop. OK, and then we're going to get into this. And yes, so better I know my queries ahead of time, Dimitri. Yes, yeah, and we'll hopefully we'll have time and we can go back to it if you want to hear more. OK, so what I want to do now here is I want to talk just a little bit about the drivers and something called Stargate. Um, so when working with Cassandra, uh, you have, uh, there, are, there are a set of, they're open source drivers. The, they're unified across um, you know, whatever version of Cassandra you're using, if you're using um, open source, or if you're using Deus Ex Enterprise, whatever, it's the same exact set of drivers. But the, the reason why I point these out, the drivers are seriously capable. They do so much for you right out of the hood, or right out of the, right out of the gate. Um, things like load balancing policies, retry policies, optimizing for where your token ranges are and the data that's coming across, all sorts of security pieces in full SSL. Object mappers, there is a support for Spring. For those of you using Spring Data Cassandra, guess what? Spring Data Cassandra uses these drivers underneath the hood. Um, you know, it, there's a ton built right into them that, especially too, when you hook up your driver, when you connect it, let's say you have a thousand node cluster, you don't need to talk to all thousand nodes. You only need to talk to just a couple of them. It will then gossip. It, it actually becomes, it, it, it talks like a node does. It becomes part of the cluster and it will find all the rest of your nodes. It'll handle all sorts of things. If a node goes down, if it can't retries, the driver does this stuff for you. Um, obviously it's supported in Java and a bunch of other things as well. Now there's another thing called Stargate though. Stargate.io, it's an open source project. It, it originated at um, uh, data stacks, but we have other uh, other supporters in there, I want to say like Walmart and Yelp are some of the other folks that are contributing as well. This now starts to expand past the normal way that I might interact with Cassandra, where before I would use a driver, I'd be using CQL or something like that. Now this essentially opens up a whole different set of APIs, things like GraphQL, REST APIs, document DBs, uh, where I can just store native JSON blobs and you know I don't have to do anything funny with them, schemaless, completely schemaless. Um, things like gRPC, uh, Pulsar, if you're familiar with um, uh, Pulsar streaming and stuff, I think there's Kafka's even incubating as well. Um, so it adds all of these other APIs that you can use to interact directly with Cassandra. Um, so the big difference there is I could do this. I don't need any drivers. I could literally go right through Stargate. Um, and if you're using open source Cassandra, you can just, Stargate, again, is open source itself. You can literally pull it down in either a tarball or a Docker container and just run it. And it'll start, you know, you, you hook it up uh, and you go, right? 
Um, I'm going to talk about something called Astra in a second, and Astra automatically has it. it it's already embedded there. Uh, but the point is, this significantly opens up the, uh, the different ways that you can do things with Cassandra. Now, moving over to the software development kit. So one of my colleagues actually uh, at slide the is frozen on uh, mapping, oh, by the way. Really? Um, yep. OK, let me, let me uh, unshare and reshare. Yeah, maybe. OK, because I didn't change anything there. Do, 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 do. And what do you see? Nothing yet. One sec. <laughs> Is it lagging? Uh, yeah, it just says you started screen sharing. OK, so it's lagging for some reason. All right, well, we'll have to. Always my favorite part about every once in a while, Zoom. Nothing? Yeah. No kidding. Uh, nothing yet. Jason, were you getting the same experience where it was just showing that one slide stuck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's nodding vigorously. Still, yeah. still stuck. Um, yeah. Uh, not Did stuck, it ever? Just, not stuck. Just blank screen. Oh, oh, geez. You know that happened to Cedric the other day, and I, geez, I don't know why all of a sudden it just decides to say, "Hey, I'm not going to do this anymore." Right, yeah, no try kidding. One more time. Somewhere, some hamster inside of a data center is dying. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anything different? Still blank screen or what? So. Far yes, yeah, we're still. Um, let me right. try. Uh, uh, slack me the link to the um, deck, and I'll try from yeah. from mine. Yeah, let's do and it. I can, yep. I can be your slide jockey. Got it. There you go. Slide jockey. Boom. Right. I'm actually. I was gonna bring up OBS. I could actually share it through my video if I need to. Oh my god. So uh, let's see. Hold on. Let me just get to this slide you were All on. Right. Yeah, and if you can do it, then I can just have you thumb through it. Yeah, totally. Um, let's see if it works before I bother optimizing. Oh, wait, you're back. Really? Yep. OK. You're back. All right, let's see what happens. Hey, sorry, folks. And you see this, if I go full screen again? Yay, yep. thumbs up. Cool. Is All it on right. SDK? Zoom is back. Zoom is back. You see this? You see SDK stuff? Yep. Woo! Yeah, we're good. All right, good, great. All right, Welcome. so you may not have seen this. I'll just do this again real quick. So here's the Stargate part, right? It's modular. You've got these different APIs, and it supports any version of Cassandra is really what that means. Open source, everything is all open source, right? So you've got this API layer, effectively. Then here's where the SDK comes in. This is the Java SDK, by the way. So you've got that Stargate layer, right? But then the Java SDK, by the way, I'm going to share this with you, this SDK, already then implements all of these APIs through the SDK. The only one you see that dotted, uh, that dashed line to GraphQL, uh, because we honestly really haven't figured out if GraphQL fits Java, if you think about it, right? We haven't figured out what that's going to do yet. There's there's stubs in there for it, but it, it doesn't do anything else. Um, but the rest of it is all there and supported. And the SDK doesn't just you know kind of automatically provide all of these interfaces for you in, in like readily um, usable objects and everything. But it also then has a Spring Boot starter. And if you use the Spring Boot starter, right, the real cool factor about this is that it will automatically it instantiates a SQL session object, which is actually from the driver. But by doing this with just a couple configuration parameters pointing to your cluster, then if you're using Spring Data, right, and if you're using uh, SCC, it, it it will just it'll automatically use that same SQL session. And Spring Data has a lot more configuration you need to do to hook it up to Cassandra. So this is built to be able to get you up and running in Java using the full-on Stargate APIs if you want, like right out of the gate, right? Um, and matter of fact, one of the resources I'm going to give you that I'm just going to talk about here in a second uh, is going to be that very repo. But then another one is going to be a workshop where it steps you through how to use this thing. It's all self-service and everything. Um, one last thing I want to mention. So Astra. Um, Astra, DataStax Astra is our uh, Cassandra as a server, uh, Cassandra as a serverless platform um, up in the cloud, right? So instead of spinning up your own Cassandra, you can just spin up one of Astra. But here's the key thing, and the only reason I would ever talk about it at a jug with a group of developers is because you can, you don't need a credit card or anything. It's absolutely free for a huge amount of data and rights and everything like that. Um, I myself, I usually have like a dozen databases in it at any given time. What this is perfect for in the free tier is you're experimenting, you've got a Greenfield app, you're just testing out, you wanna use NoSQL Bench, like you wanna, like to Ram's question I think earlier, like how many nodes do I need for what? In, 
if you don't have the expertise or if you don't have the hardware yourself or, or whatever to procure your own Cassandra nodes and everything, you can spin one up in like three minutes, right? And 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 go from there. And you can you get like a twenty five dollar credit uh, that rolls over every single month. And that's what I'm talking about, that 5 million rights, 30 million reads, the 40 gigabyte free tier. That's that $25 credit that rolls up every month indefinitely, right? It's more than enough to run small production workloads and you can do it completely for free. And the coolest part about that is you could start there. And if you're gonna do your own Cassandra, fine. It's the same drivers, it's the same Stargate, it's the same code, nothing changes except for like one line in the driver configuration that points to a contact point for your cluster instead of uh, pointing over to Astra. So so it's a really awesome tool for that. Um, even if you did never use it uh, for like a production load, even though you, that'd be wonderful, that, but that's not what we're here to talk about. And I'm not a salesperson. So <laughs> sorry, guys, stay away from that. Um, but then some of the resources, um, if you want to dig more in, I was talking about earlier, if you want to really dig more into Cassandra and, and more of like the fundamentals, getting a lot more into things like the, some of the questions about throughput and nodes and consistency levels, that's that link there that you see that Cassandra fundamentals. Um, if you want to get more into data modeling, there's some really awesome use cases, like real world use cases that explore some of the things like IoT and retail and stuff. Um, and that's a data modeling course. Those are both in our, our, our you can get them through datastacks.com, but you can also just go to Katakoda. Um, it's all free. Everything is free. We don't we don't charge for any of that kind of stuff. Um, the SDK is right there, so you can see um, the Astra dash SDK dash Java. That is the actual SDK that you can use. That Workshop Spring Stargate. That is the one that uses the SDK that you can go through in like a self service thing to figure out how to do it. Astra is there on the bottom, um, and see we have a whole set of other resources as well. Um, Academy Data It's it's pretty much what it reads. Uh, it is Academy. Uh, it's got like weeks worth of videos, uh, quizzes. You, you can download VMs and play with Cassandra clusters and do all sorts of things. Again, all that stuff is free. Um, datastacks.com slash dev is a place where you can kind of go to learn. Um, that Catacoda stuff I was talking about uh, is actually embedded right there. What that does, by the way, that'll spin up automatically Cassandra for you in the cloud. You don't have to load it on your machine. It'll do it right there embedded in your browser so you can just go and learn. Um, community.datastacks.com is like Stack Overflow for Cassandra. So we have folks from all over around the world, community members, other contributors and such that are there to answer questions, anything, if you need anything from that standpoint, like you know, you're know, you having a problem with your cluster, you've got a data modeling question, go ask it. Um, we are the Datastacks developers. We have a YouTube channel. We do workshops every week. We do net new content, usually at least once a month. Um, so if you're interested in that, you want to come to one of our workshops, again, this is all free, then go oh. subscribe, you'll get notified. And there's workshops on uh, Spring Data uh, specifically. Yeah. There's Spring Data Reactive. Yeah. Um, you know, so there's a, a fair amount of uh, if there are Spring developers here, which I know there are. Uh, there's in-depth, self-paced, or you can go to the live thing, right? Uh, yeah. On on working with Spring Data, and as you've just heard from David, working with Spring Boot and just going right at the Stargate APIs, whether it's REST, GraphQL. Well, okay, GraphQL isn't yet supported in the Java SDK. Sorry. Uh, or you want to treat it like a document <laughs> database and just throw JSON at it and not do the data modeling up front, you can, you know, you can use the Java SDK for that. Yeah, uh, and, and even though um, even though these links are in the presentation, I just dropped them to everyone as well. Um, and just to give you kind of a feel, um, here's this workshop that I'm talking about. By the way, we kind of did this one slightly tongue in cheek, the UI, the front end UI. Uh, we literally built very, very quickly for a hackathon and we have not modified it since. Uh, this is just, but the the front end UI isn't important. Um, it's more just to get the plumbing there. It's the back end. This is the one that actually explores the SDK, uses the Spring Boot starter and all that stuff. So you'll find that these are all built to be completely self-service. It'll bring you through how to do everything step by step. Um, so if you're interested in that, that's one of the links I dropped. And like I said, the other one here is the the uh, Astra SDK Java. It says Astra, but to be clear, you can use the SDK to talk to open source you know, directly to Stargate to open source Cassandra along with Astra. The instructions are for, for both are there. Um, so, so don't be fooled to think that it's just for Astra and we're trying to like loop you in or something like that. Um, and then finally, we have our Discord channel. Um, so we're there 24 seven. Uh, not that I actually like watch it 24 seven, but I think you get the idea. Like we're always there. We have people around the world around there. We're like 10,000 strong right now as a community size. We have lots of community contributors as well. Folks that 
um, like yourselves, developers who've come in, they've become part of the community and they've started helping out and answering things. So if you have questions or follow up or things you want to know, come ask, you know, I'm on LinkedIn, um, Twitter, whatever. Uh, I, you know, anytime feel free. And with that, that's the, that's the quick, let's get this done version. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, if we have questions or whatever, if someone wants me to go back to that one section, whatever you guys tell me. Cool. David, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you uh, all. M. Gitman, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what your first name is because your username just says M. Gitman. Uh, hopefully we we got through the, the greatest hits uh, quickly enough. Um, thanks for indulging while we were answering questions. And I know the side trips can be valuable, but sometimes they can distract a little bit from the, the main topic. So folks, with that, um, let's uh, guide us. Where do you want to go? Oh yeah, cool. You wanted to get to the Astra. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I think it is interesting to mention that, you know, what, what's awesome about the, the Astra thing is, you know, th that cloud service didn't exist before May 2020. So there's like no tech debt. It's all Kubernetes, Envoy, yeah. That's... Uh, Apache Pulsar, you know, it's oh, yeah. pretty, it's been pretty awesome. They, they did a lot of work breaking what's fascinating. Actually, I just made a uh, blog post on this. Um, they, they broke apart the monolithic server database process, right? And, yeah. and in so doing, created a, a, a truly serverless auto scaling data service. So uh, this thing will scale down to zero uh, for you automatically, no bullshit when you're using it. And unlike some of the other cloud services I've used, they, they we print exactly how much read ops, write ops, and and yeah. and disk space and network out you've used, so that like you know exactly where you stand in any given month, and you're not like having to call an AW. <laughs> excuse me. Uh, AWS oh, sales and, engineer, uh, to figure out yes, how and, much and to that <laughs> point, to that point, so all three of the major uh, cloud providers are supported. But here's the thing: all of the cost. I mean, obviously, like I said, that that part that's the free part is always. This is what I'm talking about. You always have this. You can create your database. You can create as many of these as you want, and you're not going to be charged a thing. You, I don't put a credit card in. You're not being charged a thing, and you never will be as long as you don't put a credit card in. Um, but this, like you see, if you look at the, like the cost for reads, write storage and that kind of deal, and you see it changes depending on, of course, the provider, but this is all baked into it. You don't have a separate AWS bill. It's just part of Astra, right? That's, we do that part for you. We're, we just, we will deploy to the cloud provider that you want for you. You don't have to worry about having an account. You don't need to sign up with them or do any of that crap. Um, and, um, I mean, you can, uh, if you want, right. We have marketplaces. Yes. So if you want the single yes. billing and all that. You can VPC so, it and you can do all, yes, you can, you yeah. can totally do it if you want to do it that way. Um, but that's, yeah, that's up to you. But if you just want to get in and create a database and, you know, you fill in, you know, jug, awesome, or whatever. And to my totally rad key space name. And you just say go and go. And now this is spinning up. It, it, it'll start off at a three node cluster, right? Three node replication factor of three right off the bat. Um, and as we talked about, we're talking, you know, it's about 40 gigs of storage, 5 million writes and about 40 million reads or the other way around. I, I'm not remembering off the top of my head, but a lot or enough where if you notice, I have a ton of databases here. I actually do things on them. I haven't enough funny enough because it flipped just recently. So all my stuff turned over. So, <laughs> but um uh, but like, I've maybe at one time used like three dollars or something, right? I've almost never come to it. And one of the actually one of the databases that I recently just deleted because uh, I'm not using it anymore is one of the ones I was doing stuff with NoSQL Bench with. And so what I was I was spinning stuff up, you know, and you know putting in millions of you know records and doing you know thousands There's of nothing, transactions nothing and, that you had to get your boss's approval for in terms no of exactly and again all the all the stuff we talked about it's all here um and then once you have once you have a database in place um you've got a console that you can go to to do cql but if you go to this connect you have the, all the apis are here uh if you go to java then you you start getting examples of like how do i do things and and such um, yep. If you go to one of the individual APIs, you can actually start doing stuff with Swagger right off the bat. Um, GraphQL, there's actually, if you've done anything with that, not, I don't know if too many Java folks have done much there, um, but there is a uh, GraphQL playground that you can actually start going in and, and just start doing things with it. Um, yep. So yeah, so there's a lot just baked in. It's a really great play space. Um, it's also wonderful if you want to go enterprise and, and you just 
scale up, as Peter said. Since we separated the compute and storage, we can give more storage. We're not paying to just sit there. So if you have data that's cold or something like that, then you're not paying to compute for it. Um, yep. And I would argue now that we have reduced the total cost of ownership enough that uh, the case the case is being made, which I've seen numbers on, and it's actually quite crazy, um, that it's cheaper to just do it here than it is on like open source, just because it'll be cheaper because of the way it runs. But what the, the key thing I want you all to know is that all of the stuff that we're doing here in Astra, the, the Kubernetes plane and everything that Peter was talking about, all of that has been back open source, right? Yep. So matter of fact, if you go to katesander.io, um, if you're interested in that kind of thing, this is all open source. So we've taken yeah. the very tech that we're using to power the thing and we're giving it out, right? Yep. And and we're saying, the here, company, you can go do this. The company's committed to Apache Public yeah. License 2.0 and, and resubmitting yeah. things through the Cassandra enhancement process and reopen sourcing them. So in the era yeah. of SSPL and elastic forking stuff and you know, Mongo going SSPL and things like that. Like we're, we're sticking by APL public license 2.0, you know, all the way. Yeah. Um, I think the one other thing that I would just mention, uh, since y'all are still here, uh, which is awesome. Thank you. Um, to give you guys a little value for, for hanging around. We're also working on some VS code plugins and some, um, IntelliJ plugins, uh, for, for doing data exploration. So that's coming. Uh, and I think the, the, the I guess one of the most um blow my hair back points that that someone made to me early on when i joined the company was you know the the dirty secret of cloud computing is that while the stateless tier is is pretty fungible and pretty flexible you know you can google cloud run your app you can cloud foundry your app you can heroku your app the the lock-in really comes on the data services right those are not portable um you know the the, the data services that are provided by these major cloud providers uh and when you invest your skills in something like this, this can go on any cloud platform and can come with you in any job or you're not locked in uh, to some kind of proprietary um, thing that is specific to one cloud provider platform. Uh, I think that was one of the other interesting observations that that I found uh, thinking about like, well, why bother, you know, spend the time learning this stuff, you know, and it's like, oh, because it can go with you, right? So just a food for thought. Um, David, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate no, it. Thank you. Thank you all for your attention and your questions and everything. Um, I know we, we started going a little over and I had to go a little fast, but I, I'm just really uh, uh, enamored that so many of you stayed. <laughs> so, <thanks. laughs> so let's open up the mic. Anyone that wants to just jump in verbally, just like, you know, uh, raise your hand or whatever. We don't have to sit, stand on ceremony and use the chat panel if you want to ask questions. Um, sweet. Thanks, M. Gitman. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, anyone wants to, anyone wants to unmute or ask anything? This and it looks like Ram has a question. Is there a separate driver for Apache Spark or can we use the same as Java? Uh, there is a, um, there is a Spark, um, there's a Spark Cassandra connector. Um, let me see if I can't just pop that up. Spark yep. Cassandra connector. Yeah. Yeah, it is, good. it is actually a different, it's not the same exact driver as the regular data sex drivers. Um, but I believe, I want to say there's actual docs though. Not you're not just limited to a GitHub repo. Here, maybe this is the one. Yeah. Now, one thing to mention, and actually, this is the DSE one. Um, if you're doing things with open source Cassandra and Spark, it's a little bit different than when you're doing. That's what I'm actually looking for. Is the proper one. Yeah, take your time. Take your time. Um, because I'm not trying to. Yeah, I don't. I'm not trying to drop the the Deus Ex Enterprise stuff here. But let's see. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, you might want to start here. Maybe I can actually look at cool. the driver. <laughs> and you know, as we're taking a position in Apache Pulsar, and you're going to be seeing a streaming offering from Astra pretty soon. Um, you know, that's going to make getting to Spark, uh, you know, even that much easier. Um, you know, as uh, as that's going to be a way of doing guaranteed, you know, pub sub, um, and uh, you know, queuing, um, you know, to a wide variety of systems. Systems, basically anything that that Pulsar supports. And you're quite you're, welcome. It's also it's in Maven. 
Yeah, there you go. It's in Maven. There, oh, Maven. There you go. Nice. Okay. Yeah, that's that's probably the nicer way to do it, honestly. Yeah, thank you, Ram. Thank you. Cool. Uh, anyone else? Any other questions? Um, you can feel free to just ask to unmute at this point. We we don't need to stand on ceremony and, and do chat. We can just talk. If not, we can call it an evening. And uh, I, I want to say thank you for your extra time, but I'm going to uh, give it another minute, or a second or two before we call it. Um, if you joined late, oh, thanks, Jason. Thanks, yeah, Jason. no, no worries. <laughs> um, if you joined late, uh, you might have missed the YouTube URL. So uh, there's the YouTube channel. Uh, you're welcome, Pierre. Uh, merci beaucoup à toi. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, the YouTube channel is there. <laughs> the YouTube channel is there. Yes. <laughs> That was my very lame attempt at French. Um, <laughs> go for it, Rom. Wait, Rom has a question. Yeah, I'm I see shocked. it. I see it. Go yeah, for it. Hold on, I'm surprised. How... <laughs> 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 um, well, and it's, it's called about, a, you know, like... <laughs> even generalization, Pierre. It's, uh, <laughs> um, you know, yeah. I took a wild, wild guess. Yes, it's your chat That's accent. Great. That's Back great. Right. Well played, sir. Well played. Oh yeah, oh, Ron, can you... <laughs> sorry. Bring it. Go right ahead. Let's see. How does one do that? Uh, one Ron, doesn't simply you... unmute. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, there we go. Bring Hello it. There. Uh, thank you, David, for answering and being patient with me. Oh, of course. Uh, no, one... no. Great questions, by the way. <laughs> I have uh, one more question. Uh, actually, two questions on Cassandra. Okay. So whenever, uh, if you are using Cassandra with any uh, streaming application like a Kafka or a Spark streaming, uh, like you said earlier, if a node goes down, right, uh, uh, the Cassandra itself have a gossip protocol, so it will internally can uh, node it. But what if uh, a streaming application, when it's connected to a, a, a come node on Cassandra, uh, how yeah. does it work? So how does is it taken care by driver or how does it uh, get resolved? Yeah, so it's, it's still gonna, you know, it, Again, this is where your replication factor comes into play, and the and the fact that you know you're going to want to have that replication factor of three is that nice standard because even in a streaming case, you're still going to have three nodes that can facilitate that particular request for some piece of data, right? So if you have a node goes down, you'll have two other nodes. Uh, so when the request comes in, and you know a coordinator is going to manage that, then there's still two nodes that can that can facilitate that. And unless you had a case where you had like all the nodes go down. Or uh, or something like that, then then it would work. I would think just the same as it would if you were talking with your application in a non-streaming sense. No, no. So in the like in a regular application, let's say if I have an application, it's connected to uh, one node, right? It's always tied yeah. to that node. And whenever it's trying to make a connection, oh, if the node goes down, how does it get? That would talk? that would be an extremely strange thing to have a case where you're tied to an individual node. Um, matter of fact, I would even call that out. Maybe there's some cases in it, but I'd even call that out as like an anti-pattern, right? Because if you have one of the benefits you get with something like Cassandra and the fact that it's distributed, right, is that you in fact do have, I'm just going to stick with the replication factor of three, by the way, you have three nodes that can facilitate that request. So if you somehow tie forcibly your application ever only talk to one node, you've just lost the vast majority of the capabilities that Cassandra gives you from availability, from performance and everything. Because then to your point, if that one node goes down, now what do I do, right? And from a load balancing standpoint, if I'm ever only saying, no, I'm only going to ever hit that one node, um, then I'm not taking advantage of the other two nodes that have that data. And so then I have a very good chance, right? If let's say that that, for whatever reason, the applications that's tied to that one node is really, really hammering it. Now I've got one node that I might potentially overload, right? And slow it down and such. So I would I would think that would be very strange that you would, that the driver, I don't think will even let you tie it to a single node. You'll have to, you need to go through the coordinator because that's that's how you get the functionality out of Cassandra. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that's true. Yeah, that, that's where I'm getting it. So the, the usually the okay. driver will uh, ask you to provide a list of nodes uh, that are the oh. Right. Oh, oh yeah, it's, e it's even easier than that. Yeah, um, the driver, the driver. When you first connect, let's say you're not using you're not using Astro or doing anything like that. You're using open source Cassandra. You have what are called contact points. So when you configure your driver, other than like your username and password, whatever the authentication is, right? You're going to provide some contact points. 
Um, no matter what the size of the cluster is, you, you want a, a, more than one of those, right? Because again, from a resiliency standpoint, if you only provide one and then right at the moment your application goes to talk to the cluster that one node isn't available or connectable, well then now what's it gonna do? So you, you provide a couple of them, right? Three. At that point, the moment through your application, the driver connects to the cluster, it will automatically start to gossip and to talk and to get all of the information about your cluster, right? And the topology and everything. Um, at, once it makes that connection, that any time a request comes in, it's not worried about an, an individual node. This is actually when I talked about some of the stuff the driver does, like the token aware policies and everything. This is where some of the coolness comes in. So the drivers, okay, it's become aware of your cluster. A request comes in to do something, right? So remember, you've got your partition key, that, and you always have to apply. You always have to, uh, you know, have that in your in your queries. That partition key gets hashed out to the token. Well, guess what? The driver's going to take that and it's going to go, oh, hey. I know the token for this. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to route you automatically to a node or nodes that can get you that data. It's going to automatically load balance, right? So it's got a round robin token aware policy. So it's, what that means is it's going to, for one, try to optimize and put you on a node that already has the data, right? So you reduce network hops. But if for some reason it can't do that, that's fine. Um, but then it will automatically round robin and such around the nodes that own that particular token range and so on and so forth. So the driver's handling that stuff for you. And if you wanted to do something different, you can actually create your own custom policies, your own custom load balancing and everything. But the driver is doing that for you. You should not be tied to an individual node. Okay, makes sense. Thanks, David. Okay. Yeah. Go for it, Jason. Oh, are you saying, oh, Jay, Jason's got a question. <laughs> You've been very patient. You should be unmuted now. Okay. Um, Given that, are there like, if you have a huge cluster, is all of the is all of the metadata about that cluster and like where token, like which tokens are at the where, are they all being managed in the in the driver and therefore in the memory of the client of? Great question. So, yes, yeah. mostly. Um, it's not all of the token ranges for everything, but here's. You, you just pointed out something that I, I totally glossed over when we talked about the driver. When you, when you are using the driver in your code, um, it's, you, you want to treat it like a singleton. You, you need one SQL session object only. And the exact reason for that is what you just explained. Because what you don't want to do is if you create a bunch of those, and if you create it, because each one of those, by the way, just to give you a little context, the driver will maintain by itself connection pools with every node. And each node, again, can handle thousands of transactions a second, right? So that's that alone, right? That that can be pretty significant. Um, and then you're right, the metadata and everything. So you only ever need to instantiate, like you'll, you'll, it used to be separated between a cluster and session, but now it's just the SQL session. You need one of those only throughout your whole app. And that's part of the reason why, because if you created another one, now you have to maintain all those connection pools, the metadata and everything yet over again. So yeah, there is a footprint. Um, it's not, you know, I, Honestly, I do not remember off the top of my head, like the size of that footprint, but it's not one of those things that like, you know, you're eating up half your application's RAM just to talk to the database or something like that. And to your question about like token ranges, um, it, it doesn't have to go and underlying know every single, you know, it doesn't have to know all the individual ranges for like every partition. All it needs to know is, you know, for, for a particular uh, node, you know, where's my ballpark? And then it's going to try to route it where it goes, but then your coordinator is going to be responsible for that, right? So that's actually outside of the driver. Once it hits the cluster, is going to be the part that's really ultimately responsible for getting that request where it needs to go. That makes a lot of but sense. But yes, you're correct. You're correct. Ballpark. Metadata and everything is stored there that in that SQL session. That's why you just want one of those. But ballpark metadata, and then the real thing is picked up by the coordinator. Yeah. And exactly. what's actually cool about that, by the way, um, oh, and, and thank you, Ram. Thank you. What's cool about that, by the way, is once it dis once it connects and it discovers things, then you can query that metadata and essentially get an instantaneous response without having the network hop latency or whatever talking directly to the cluster because the driver itself already has the metadata, right? So if you want to know certain things about your, your cluster, you can just go ask it because it already just found those things out. And just like a, in, in the regular cluster where it gossips, it's going to gossip and it's going to get up to date, you know, so if things change in the cluster, it's going to be aware of those. Um, so it's actually kind of a nice little mechanism in there. It'll cache that locally, you know, within the app and all that. Sweet. 
That's a great question. Yeah. yeah. I, I just learned a lot. Thank you. Yeah, the driver, honestly, I, I, I joke about this. I never thought I'd be excited talking about drivers. And the drivers are seriously cool. Like, and, and we've open sourced them now. So, I mean, that's something if you really want to, uh, it was open source last year, you could totally take a look at that, uh, you know, if you're, you're so inclined and like look at the details or just look at the docs, you get the same answers, but <laughs> probably easier to look at the docs than to try to read the code. Wow, loving the questions. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, more, uh, we're probably gonna call it in about 10 minutes. So, uh, cause poor David is on the East Coast and is, uh, you know, um, I mean, he's a late night kind of guy. I, I know this, but it's, you know, it's okay. We didn't have Cedric come on. It's like two in the morning for him right now. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. He's, in, he's in Paris in France, which is how I knew that Pierre was branche. <laughs> nice, Peter. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jason shaking his head. <laughs> like, Go back to your day job. <laughs> All right. Put him do Hey, David, I have one more question on the yeah, range, please. Uh, range queries. I read in one of the blogs uh, saying that it's not a good practice to use a lot of range queries on uh, Cassandra. Uh, is that uh, true? Or if it is not, uh, can we only use the range queries on the clustering key and we should never use the range queries on the primary because that takes up a lot of resources? Yeah, no. Um, yeah, range queries are definitely just you know, compared to when you are selecting, again, remember you want to reduce the amount of reads, right? That's that's the goal. Um, so if you select a partition, you go right for a partition with nothing else. Boom, you're you know one read, you're going to get the whole thing. Wonderful. Um, the second you start to go into like range queries and things, now you have to do a little bit more work to get the data, right? Um, so so yes, there. You know, if you if you do that a lot, um, they're fine. Uh, honestly, um, I would say though, if if you find yourself in a case, I guess it depends on the model and depends on your SLAs. Um, if you find that you're doing a lot of them, but they meet your SLAs, you're probably okay. And by using, when you're doing range queries, you're doing that within your clustering keys anyway. So you're doing it the right way where it becomes or can become a little bit more interesting. And I, I wonder if maybe some of the blog posts talk about this at all, are where you start to get into indexing. Right, things like secondary indexes and such. Um, and one of the core differences about what those do compared to a regular um, partitioning and clustering a key scheme is where, you know, when you're working with your uh, partition keys and your your primary keys and such like that, you're essentially, you know, you're you're working directly with the data that's in a partition, right? Um, but when you then start to expand out and use something like a secondary index and you're not using your partition key, and now you're starting to add in columns and say where, and you're looking for some range of columns, you know, like some data range um, within some columns. Now you have to start scanning across your partitions, right? And that's where things start getting a little bit more expensive. Um, and, and in some cases, it can be a lot more expensive, right? There are, there are definitely some places where you should not use uh, secondary indexes. In Cassandra, we tend to, we tend to start with if you have a need for a query that is going outside of what you can do in, naturally in your primary key, it's probably time to create another table with a different query access pattern to answer that because by denormalizing, you're going to always be able to maintain those tight SLAs. That's what we're after, right? In Cassandra, we're always after those tight SLAs at any scale, right? Um, however, and I, I think I mentioned this earlier, right? Where secondary indexes are more about convenience than performance, there are cases where they might make sense, right? But you just have to understand that your SLAs aren't going to be as tight. Sure, yeah, but like so, use way too many of them and too often is kind of a design smell, so to speak. Yes, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's exactly. Like, hey, well, hold on, this is happening so often that we should consider making another table and just using the the, the more built-in you know, built structures. Exception, <laughs> not rule. But you know, here's the, the general the general rule though is, you know, do your queries within a partition, right? So if you're doing your queries per partition, you know, even if you're looking at a range within clustering columns or something like that, that's that's okay, right? It's when you start spanning across. One of the things that I see a lot, and I don't know if this is what you were getting at, Ram, so you can correct me if I'm off. One of the things I see a lot um, 
that people are like, why doesn't this work well, right? Is using in, using an in statement and adding like a thousand, or I don't actually, I won't even let you do that. But like, that's something we do in the relational world, right? You just kind of just add those in there and then just do in. But in Cassandra, what you're really doing when you, every time you add another partition in the in, in clause, what are you doing? Well, you're just, you're, you're going to another partition, another partition. Um, and so now you're, you could be, those partitions could be all over your cluster, right? So instead of now getting that data from a single node, now you just ask Cassandra, oh, I need you to go get that from these 20 different nodes because I just asked her for 20 different partitions that were sp spread across all my cluster. I hope that distinction makes sense. I don't know, did I yes. answer what you were looking for there? Yeah, yeah exactly, David. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks, Peter and uh, David, for the presentation. Yeah, thank you, Ram. I appreciate it. Hey, Jason. Trying to unmute um, you there, Jason. Yeah, oh, I, got, go. I got it. Um, so the the biggest leap for me is thinking about. You mentioned a case where, like, oh, if you're if you're starting to query like this, maybe you just need a new table mm -hmm. with new denormalization. Yep. Um, but if you have like a user table, it's got a million rows in it. Okay. You probably have multiple user tables, I imagine, and most that would have it's denormalized. So like you're gonna query users this way, you have a million rows this, you have a million rows in that one, a million rows in that one, and then you you come up with a new query pattern. Like what sort of time frames can you expect to say, oh, I actually I need to roll out this new table with this new query pattern, and I need to basically scan this other scan these other tables to populate the new table mm -hmm. like is there tooling around that available and yeah how, like, yeah there is how painful is that process yeah so so that process has actually gotten a lot nicer um there's multiple ways you can you can skin that uh, yes there are tools one uh, if you're going to do it in the uh more you could do it online or offline but there's one called ds bulk again it's an, it's an open tool uh it's totally free uh it works with open source cassandra and that would be, that is actually essentially an ETL tool for Cassandra, um, but it's one that is very performant. Uh, it's purpose-built for Cassandra and you could use it. So if you had to do, you know, and what I think you're talking about isn't so much schema migration where you're moving from one query access pattern to another, but a case where you're gonna keep the existing tables in place and you need another one that answers this other query access pattern, right? Um, so in a case like that, you could totally use something like the Bulk where you create your new table, you extract the data from the current one with DS bulk, and then use it to put it into the other one, right? Um, you could totally do that. You could also do that at the application level, depending on what you're doing, right? Now, most people don't want to go off and, you know, you're like, well, wait, do I want to have to use my app to read the data from one to another? No, not really. I would, again, I would use DS bulk for that. Um, but you could, you could, you know, depending on what you're doing, you could stream it, you could use Spark. Right, that's another option. If you if you actually had a Spark cluster, um, one thing you can this is actually I, I think a cool feature uh, going back to data centers about Cassandra. I actually love this from an you know, Cassandra is clearly not and not meant to be an OLAP database. Period. Right, right. it's an old TP database, and and that's that's where it's it's that's its home. So when you start getting into migrating data and things like that, you know, especially depending on the amount of data you might have. Right, that's by its nature. Uh, if it's more than you know a, a thousand rows or something, it's probably going to take more time than what Cassandra is is going to be expecting because it's OLTP. Um, so what I'm what I'm driving at there is that is a case where sometimes someone will stand up, they'll stand up another data center with Spark right next to it, and it's another Cassandra is another Cassandra data center. So you just use replication. So it just replicates the data back and forth on its own automatically. But then you can actually use Spark. This is getting a little bit more advanced, but it's a, it's a fun case for those who use Spark, where you can use Spark to generate the new table on the fly by reading the data from the old table and transforming it into the new table. The coolness factor though, is since you're doing it on another data center, separate from your main one where your old TP transactions are happening, all of the compute is happening on the Spark data center. It does the work there and then just automatically replicates it right back to the old TP one. So you don't pay the compute cost because the point is, is if you have an old TP data center, what don't you want to do? You don't want to get in the way of it being able to handle all of those transactions, right? 
Um, and I don't know how familiar you are with Spark, but if you're doing like, you know, long running jobs or OLAP jobs and you're slowing down, you're overloading your OLTP nodes, you're going to, you're going to potentially slow down your ingest. Um, so anyway, that is a different, the simple way is DS bulk, by the way, <laughs> that is the very simple way to just do it real quick in your app, right? Just do it DS bulk and you're good to go. Um, but if, again, if you're, you're someone who's using Spark and you have that kind of stuff going on, it's a really neat mechanism and a feature that Spark data can send her, I mean, it makes it, uh, the Spark data uh, connector, sorry. It makes it super simple to use the types of things in Spark. To do. It's almost like you're doing a subquery with a select star from in a relational database. You can kind of do the equivalent in Spark is what I'm getting at, if that makes sense. The very short answer, DS bulk. <laughs> Yeah, I could have, I, I did just I did start with that, but I started with that and then went on for like 10 minutes. Yeah. No, no, I think I think that other answer that it is fascinating though, because it's like you can with the replication abilities, like with a bunch of customers are using that kind of stuff um for the purposes you mentioned and and wider, um, because the, the replication abilities are are pretty good. Um, that, I'll tell you the, the Spark one just to kind of go on that a little bit more. Um that one let, let's not hold on, let's not let's Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no um, any last ones? And if not, we can we can continue on that topic if you want, Jason, for sure. Obviously. Oh, and I was just gonna say something for a second. Yeah, it wasn't gonna be a huge long okay. thing. Um, okay. Are we good though on the questions? You think? Anyone else? Okay. Yeah. So, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. On the, uh, when, yeah. I first, um, when I first when I first got into doing some of the stuff with Spark and what you can do there, um, it, especially with the schema migration piece, it, it kind of feels like magic. Like once you get the pattern down, you can use, you can in like this much code, you can have Spark create your new table, bring the data over, do the whole thing. And because it's Spark and it's Spark jobs and it's meant for long running jobs, right? It does not a way that is safe to your to your old TP data and everything like that. And then as that's being built, it literally is being replicated over real time, right back to the other one. And it just becomes available. So you start the thing over here and then it just starts showing up in your old TP data center. And, uh, and it does it all for you without taking off any of the compute. I, I found it magical. It was, it was, it, there's no magic in it really, but I mean like, yeah, it was a cool process. It was fun. Anyway, that was it. That was just my side comment. My six-year-old is here telling me that the meetup is now over. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. He actually wants me to play around some virtual backgrounds. But um, yeah, I think let's let, let David go. It's it's now pretty late East Coast time. Thank you very much for sticking with us for this long. This is awesome. Yeah, thank you, everybody. That's awesome.